Hi everyone, and welcome to this short snackable video about how to monitor the health and performance of your Amazon ElastiCache serverless cache. My name is Damon LaKyle. I'm a principal solutions architect here at AWS, and I hope you'll find this session interesting and can immediately put it to use. So let's dive in. ElastiCache serverless is a big shift from the traditional cluster management approach. There are no nodes to size, no shards to rebalance, and it automatically scales based on your application's needs but just because it's serverless doesn't mean you shouldn't know what's going on under the hood. Monitoring your cache is still essential, especially if you care about application performance, user experience, and cost efficiency. And the good news is, AWS gives you the metrics you need to stay ahead of issues, understand usage patterns, and optimize your design. Now, a quick note on terminology before we dive in. If you're using ElastiCache serverless today, you're almost certainly using Valky. Valky is a drop-in replacement for Redis OSS, and is backed by the Linux Foundation, ensuring it will remain open source forever. So I may use the terms ElastiCache and Valky interchangeably in this video for simplicity's sake, but in reality, ElastiCache is a fully managed service provided by Amazon Web Services, while Valky is one of several engines that ElastiCache supports. All right, with that set, the first metric we'll discuss focuses on memory capacity. This metric is called bytes used for cache, and it's exactly what you would think. It is how much memory your cache is using, but not just for your data, it also includes Valky's metadata, buffers, and so on. Essentially, everything that Valky needs to operate, not just the data set itself. So you can think of this really as bytes used for Valky. In this screenshot from CloudWatch, you can see that I ran a workload that consistently added new keys into the cache. This cache is set to have a maximum memory capacity of one gigabyte, so you can see as it grew, it never exceeded that value. ElastiCache Serverless will automatically scale the cluster up to the maximum memory limit you specify. You'll want to monitor this metric to understand growth trends. If you're consistently close to your cap, it might be time to rethink what data you're storing or raise that limit. And if you're constantly at the maximum you've configured, you're going to see evictions when you attempt to write more data. Which leads us to the next topic, evictions. As you add keys to ElastiCache, the memory footprint will grow. You have the option to set a maximum memory limit in serverless up to a maximum of five terabytes, and the cache will automatically scale up to your defined limit if it needs to. But once it hits the limit that you define, ElastiCache needs to make room, and that's where evictions come into play. You can see in this screenshot that we included the evictions metric with the memory metric. This shows that as we continue to write new data into the cache, the memory did not grow, but ElastiCache did have to evict keys so it could make room for the new data being written. ElastiCache Serverless uses a fixed eviction policy called Volatile LRU, or Least Recently Used, which is important to remember. That means when memory is full, it will start evicting the least recently used keys, but only if they have a Time to Live, or TTL, set on them. So keys without a TTL assigned will not be evicted, which may lead to unnecessary memory usage. But what if memory fills up with non-expiring keys, which means they don't have time to live values? You'll likely run into out-of-memory errors, which would then cause write commands to fail. So what should you watch for? If evictions are low and occasional, that's fine. But sustained or sudden spikes, especially during peak app traffic, are worth investigating. Look at how much memory you're using, how often you're writing, and whether your keys are configured with appropriate time to live values. Evictions are your early warning system that your working set is getting too big for your memory ceiling. Let's move on to see what's actually causing that churn. For that, we look at get type commands and set type commands. These metrics show you the number of read and write operations your cache is handling. Things like get, hget, and l range for reads, and set, hset, and sadd for writes. If you see high read volume, you'll want to check that your cache hit rate is staying healthy, which we'll look at on the next slide. But if you see a large drop in get type commands where it would normally be high, that might be a traffic routing issue, or maybe a service is down that is running your application. With set type commands, if you're seeing high write traffic, especially sustained writes, with no time to live values associated with them, that could lead to memory pressure and eventually trigger evictions. Keep in mind you might have a batch job that runs on a regular basis, so this number may not always be consistent. You need to understand your workload first to know whether this is abnormal behavior or not. Watch for changes here over time. These two metrics also give you a good feel to know if your workload is either read heavy or write heavy. 
and tell a kind of story of what your app is doing with the cache. Next up, are those reads and writes actually effective? And if so, how effective are they? If you need to check at a glance to see how effective your cache is, you can look at the cache hit rate metric. Here you can see that the cache hit rate starts at zero and steadily climbs until it reaches one, which is a 100% cache hit rate. For most workloads, you want that hit rate to be above 0.9 or above 90% if you can. Anything lower, and you might be writing data that never gets reused or evicting too early. We calculate hit rate with this formula. Cache hit rate equals cache hits divided by the sum of cache hits plus cache misses. These two metrics, cache hits and cache misses, tell you how effective your cache really is. A hit means Elasticache had the data in memory and is exactly what we want. A miss means it wasn't in memory. If you get a cache miss, that isn't necessarily unexpected for a caching use case. That's because your application may go to another source to fetch the data and then refreshes the cache with new results, though this process will certainly be slower than if it had been in cache in the first place. But if your use case is something other than caching query results, maybe it's a session store, a geospatial index, a leaderboard, a streaming use case, or something else, this is something to watch out for. Remember when we talked about evictions a few minutes ago? Consider this. If your cache miss rate is high and your eviction rate is also high, that might mean your cache is churning too fast. Also, if your miss rate is high but evictions are low, you might not be caching enough data to begin with. As with many things in life, and especially in monitoring systems, one data point should not be considered in a vacuum. Take a more holistic approach and combine metrics to get a better picture of the health of your cache. Now let's talk about latency, which is a hot topic when discussing Elasticache because it's incredibly fast, where even a millisecond of network latency can have a dramatic impact. In this example, we have our applications running on Amazon EC2 with a Valky client. First, these clients make a request. Now the first latency related issue we face is the network hop from the application to the service. This is usually a few hundred microseconds one way. Next, the request arrives at the Elasticache node responsible for the request. The request goes through the network stack and kernel, then it gets put into client input buffers by a multi-threaded I.O. model. At this point, we start timers for two metrics. The first is called successful read request latency, and the second is successful write request latency. Both metrics measure the total time spent within the Elasticache engine itself not including operating system overhead or network latency. We'll come back to this in a moment. The next step is when the command actually starts to execute within the engine. As an example, a simple operation like a get or a set will usually take just a few microseconds to complete. Once it's done processing, it gets sent to the client output buffers through the same multi-threaded I.O. model that we used for the client input buffers. Once the response leaves the buffer and gets sent to the kernel for outbound delivery, that's when we stop the timer for both request latency metrics. After that, the response then has to go through the kernel and network stack again, and importantly, make another network hop back to the client. So you have two metrics you can monitor in CloudWatch for serverless latency, which are successful read request latency and successful write request latency. A healthy system with a normal load will usually be around one to two milliseconds. Now to be clear, only your application sees the round trip latency. The service, of course, doesn't have visibility into what the total round trip latency is, since it doesn't know how long the request took to get to it or how long it took the response to arrive at the client. So if CloudWatch is showing one to two milliseconds, but your application is seeing 10 milliseconds for a round trip, it means that the eight millisecond difference is coming from something else. All right, since we've talked about server and client latency, Let's talk now about client connections themselves. We have two metrics to look at, current connections and new connections. Current connections is pretty straightforward. It shows you how many active connections your cluster currently has open. Elasticache is built to handle a very large number of concurrent connections, up to 65,000 per serverless cache. That's a lot, but it's still a ceiling. Ideally, your current connections metric stays fairly consistent below the 65,000 connection limit. Taking a look at our CloudWatch screenshot here, we see that there are consistently just a handful of current connections. It's a good sign that the number of current connections, whatever that number is, is fairly constant. It means we always have a few clients connected, which we would expect. This should roughly match the total number of applications you have accessing the cache, or the number of connections per application. Conversely, if this metric suddenly drops, especially during normal usage hours, it might indicate network issues, 
timeouts, or authentication failures. It might even mean users aren't able to access their data, so this is a good metric to alarm on as well. This metric doesn't tell the whole story, though. It only captures the number of connections at the time the metric was captured. But what if there was an error in the application? Maybe it continuously opens a connection, immediately closes it for some reason over and over. In that case, we won't see a big change in the current connections metric. That's because this is a kind of point-in-time snapshot of that metric. So whenever the metric was recorded, that's how many existing connections were in place. But luckily for us, Elasticache has another metric called new connections, which actually counts the number of connections that have occurred over a span of time. Now in this new diagram, we blended in new connections with current connections, and we see a much different picture. We're seeing almost 2,500 new connections every minute. It's so high, in fact, that we can just barely see the current connections line near the bottom. 2,500 new connections per minute is equal to about 40 new connections every second. That's not good for your application, but even more importantly, that's not good for your customers. If you see sudden spikes in this metric, it might mean a misbehaving app that isn't reusing connections properly. It might also mean that there was a large disconnect for some reason, and a large number of clients are attempting to reconnect. A best practice in this situation is to modify your client's connection logic to implement an exponential backoff approach. This way, when it times out trying to connect, it will pause longer between each retry. Next up is Elasticache Processing Units, or eCPUs. eCPUs are a serverless specific metric that replaces traditional CPU usage. They represent a blend of command execution and network transfer load. This is the metric customers will want to track when considering their budget as it is directly tied to the cost of serverless. Our documentation and pricing page have several examples of what constitutes an eCPU. But in short, reads and writes require one eCPU for each kilobyte of data transferred. For example, a get command that transfers 3.2 kilobytes of data will consume 3.2 eCPUs. Commands that require additional vCPU time or transfer more than one kilobyte of data will consume proportionally more eCPUs. In the screenshot here, we can see that depending on the minute, we're getting anywhere from 4,000 eCPUs to up to 215,000 eCPUs. Again, this metric reflects both processing time and data transferred. Higher eCPU usage means your cache is working harder. And keep in mind, that isn't a bad thing. You want your cache active so that it relieves pressure from slower or overworked backend systems. All right, during this video, we've covered several metrics that give you visibility into the health, performance, and capacity of your Elasticache serverless cache, from traffic and latency to memory and processing. The system does the scaling and management for you, but your insight into these metrics helps you make smart, proactive decisions. I'd encourage you to visit our documentation where you can see even more metrics to monitor and why they're important. Thanks again for joining me. I hope this gave you a solid foundation to build from. So keep monitoring, keep optimizing, and we'll see you next time.